to introduce you to a potential resource for research, the Museum of the Horse. I'm Sally Mitchell, and I'm a fanatical collector of equestrian antiques and antiquities. The museum is housed in an old coaching house, which was also a posting house. That's where they changed horses on the coaches. There are nine roomfuls of all sorts of things, but today I'm going to concentrate on the very early pieces, which may be of interest to you. Some of my archaeologist friends have told me that it's a standing joke amongst archaeologists. If you find a piece of metal that no one can identify, then call it a piece of horse harness. It's pretty difficult to identify a lot of the pieces that were used with horses, certainly for non-horse folk and quite often for horse people too. A couple of events recently convinced me of the fact that we could be quite useful to archaeologists. Somebody sent me a photograph similar to that in the top right hand corner. It was something they dredged up from a lake and they thought it must be something to do with horses from World War I. In actual fact, it's a lot older than that. I wonder if you know what it is. I was delighted to be able to tell them that it was actually a Roman hippo sandal. Some weeks later, a lady working on Hadrian's Wall came to visit the museum and was fascinated to see the rush slipper. And I explained that actually this was what the Romans were trying to recreate in iron when they made the hippo sandal. It must have been a very big jump for anybody to imagine that you could actually nail a piece of iron onto a living creature. But somehow they finally discovered that you could. The outer wall of the horse's hoof has no nerves in it and is very strong. However, shoeing is a very delicate and technical job. You have to get the nail far enough up the wall for it to hold the shoe on, but if you get it in at the wrong angle, it pierces the living area inside the hoof where there are nerves causing great pain and probably causing tetanus or infection. As the sole of the hoof is solid, it would be very difficult for this infection to escape. And in days without antibiotics and anti-tetanus, jabs, it would probably have killed the horse. It would certainly have made it extremely lame. However, this is one of the earlier shoes, and you can see that where the nail holes were knocked in, they couldn't control the outer edge, and it became wavy. It wasn't until the invention of the anvil, that's the image on the right, and the horn on the anvil, which is the pointy bit, which is rounded so that you can put the shoe onto it and keep the outer side of the edge of the shoe smooth. So later shoes don't have this wavy edge. It's generally cons considered that maybe this was introduced by the Romans, the late Romans, or the Normans. I don't think anyone is quite sure. Of course, horseshoes are the most likely thing you will find. Horses lost shoes very easily. This shows you the different types of shoes for different creatures. The shoe on the left obviously is a horseshoe. The two in the middle are for a donkey and a mule. They have a different shape, foot to a horse. And the sketch on the right is that of an ox shoe. Dating shoes is quite complex and depends on a number of features. The width of the web, the type of nail hole, the type of nails used, whether or not the 
a shoe is fullered, that's the groove that allows the nails to be sunk below the surface of the shoe, and the shape of the hole in the centre of the shoe. Here you can see on the left a tongue shoe, and in the middle a keyhole shoe. The variety of purposes for which shoes were used also complicates matters. Here we have veterinary shoes. And shoes for various different purposes. If you think that horseshoes are complex, then spurs are considerably more so. However, they do come in a wide variety of shapes and designs, which probably makes them easier to identify. The spurs here are just a small selection of early spurs that you might well dig up in England. The top left-hand corner is a Celtic spur. The two below are Romano-Celtic, and the little bronze one at the bottom is Roman. The one in the middle at the top is 11th or 12th century, and the one at the bottom is 15th century. The one above that on the right is 17th century, and the strange-looking thing in the top right-hand corner is a very rare spur and thought to be 18th century. I find non-horse folk are often confused between what is a spur and what is a stirrup. The top right-hand corner is a spur, a Roman one. The middle is a stirrup, and to confuse things, the bottom right-hand corner is a stirrup cum spur. Even the experts can be confused. This item appeared in one of the leading London antiquities auctions recently, catalogued as a very rare spur. Someone paid quite a lot for it, so they must have thought it rare too. It isn't a spur. I wonder if anyone knows what it is. I'll tell you at the end of the talk. Stirrups are less likely to be found, but we have a good selection in the museum, and this is a couple of examples of very early stirrups. The first has a twisted knob to form the hanger and has a riveted attachment to the hanger for fixing it to the saddle. The one on the right is a typical Viking stirrup, and to see a really fine Viking stirrup, there's the best I have ever seen in Lincoln in the collection that was dredged up from the Trent. When researching, do be careful what you read. A paper was written recently on this Romano-Celtic bit by someone connected to a leading American museum, and she totally misunderstood it. Uh, in effect, rewriting the history of the development of the bit by about a thousand years. Very dangerous. Apart from the leading German archaeological studies on bits, which I'm sure you all know about, I can recommend two extremely good books. The first is Eparon by Georges Nabara Satule. Uh, the second book he published, the first is a hardback, the second paperback, an extensive and informative book on spurs. The second is by Claudio Gianelli, and it is a study of bits, Equus Pronatus, with wonderful photographs of bits in his collection. He is not only an Olympic horseman, but a world-leading antique dealer too. So his collection is out of this world. So, we come back to this spur. In actual fact, it's a butterfly bit that's been turned inside out. I don't actually have one of those, but I have similar 
many similar, and they are the most vicious bits. They're bits that you could hook onto bit rings, and the general theory was that the more pain you gave the horse in its mouth, the more easily it could be controlled. You can see this is an example of one on the right with serrated and moving parts in the mouth. Wicked, absolutely wicked. So if you have something that you're not quite certain about, please do come and see us at the museum and maybe we can help. There are lots of other things to see there as well, and we'd love to see you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>